Welcome to the Hiking Through Podcast, where we get to pull up a seat at the campfire and have a conversation about all things through hiking. I'm Erin Egan, and today's guest is Snake Eyes, known off trail as Paul Barak. He's hiked a few trails in his day, but the Shikoku Pilgrimage Trail is where it all started. A 750-mile trail visiting 88 temples, it encircles Shikoku Island in Japan and follows the travels of Kukai, an 8th-century Shingon Buddhist monk. In this episode, we talk about his book, Fighting Monks and Burning Mountains, and the amazing adventure that was his 2010 pilgrimage. Enjoy my conversation with Snake Eyes. Well, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Um, I'm really actually excited to talk to you because reading your book, I was like, ooh, you know, this is something that I could totally get behind toing. You know, I, I had my ninja phase back in my teenage years. Oh yeah, <laughs> like all cool people. <laughs> so like I started reading your book, um, Fighting Monks and Burning Mountains, uh, which is brand new published, right? Uh, published a couple of years ago. Oh, okay, well, it, it's brand new published for me, <laughs> for my purposes. <laughs> um, but I started reading it and I was like, this is incredible that I've never heard of this before. <laughs> So I have a feeling that most of the people who are listening to this podcast are probably the same. Like they've yeah, never heard of it. Don't feel alone there. Uh, even when, like it's said that more Japanese people have been to Paris than have been to Shikoku Island. And um, when I flew out to Japan, I was staying with uh, these two friends of mine from my karate dojo back in Seattle who'd moved back to Japan. And uh one of them was just like asking me like, how did you hear about this? Because like, I was telling my friends about you and that you were about to go do this hike and they've never heard of it. So like, how did yeah. you like come across this idea? Yeah, so tell us. And also like, can you explain a little bit what the Shikoku trail slash pilgrimage is uh, for the purposes of everybody listening? Of course. Um, so the Shikoku pilgrimage is this um, 12 to 1300 year old pilgrimage that uh, is part of the Shingon Buddhist sect. Uh, the founder of Shingon Buddhism is uh, named Kukai or Kobo Daishi. He was a, a, <clears throat> a monk from the 8th, uh, 8th century, just very famous in Japan. He has a really interesting history. Uh, he was the founder of Shingon Buddhism. He was an ambassador to China. He uh, was responsible for a bunch of like public works projects. Like there's still a levy uh, in Japan that he built, but he also is just this man of legend who's like, you know, out there not only attaining enlightenment, but also like punching dragons and, you know, kicking ghosts out of, uh, kicking ghosts out of temples. So uh, historically, he's uh, kind of an everyman, you could say. <laughs> he's but, almost like the Renaissance man or the, um, what is it, like the Ben Franklin, like he sort of did it definitely. all. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, there, there should be a cartoon with him and a little mouse friend that should be made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the Shikoku pilgrimage itself is this 750 mile pilgrimage that starts on from the first temple uh, of Japan's smallest and most rural of the main islands, Shikoku, which literally means for region, Shi for Koku region. And the pilgrimage from temple one travels clockwise around the island visiting these 88 temples that dot the uh, perimeter. And some of these temples are on, you know, a cliffside, some of them are on mountaintops, some of them are in forests, some are in the center of rice fields, some are in the center of towns. So it's this very uh, varied pilgrimage with this uh, super fascinating history that's full of legend and some monsters. Uh, which I always find fascinating. And it, uh, the four regions also uh, correspond to the four levels of spiritual enlightenment of a pilgrim. So Tokushima, the first region, 
is the land of awakening faith. Uh, Kochi, the second region, is the land of ascetic training. That's the hardest one, obviously. Uh, and then Ihime is the land of enlightenment. And uh, Kagawa is the land of Nirvana. And what I think is one of the coolest things about the pilgrimage is that it's circular. And so after you finished at Temple 88 and are in the land of Nirvana, you travel back to Temple 1 to officially finish your pilgrimage because your spiritual journey is never over. Right. And as part of, is this something that you put into your pilgrimage or is this an accepted practice? Because you talk about coming back to number one at the end and having to account for your pilgrimage and talk to, to Koku about, uh, no, what is this? What is the? Uh, it's Kukai. Kukai. To talk to Kukai about what you've learned or what you've uh, achieved through this pilgrimage. Um, so that is not just me, that's a traditional okay. part, which is another just super cool thing about the pilgrimage. Uh, that's not actually a temple one. So oh, okay. after the pilgrimage, you return back to the main island and go to Mount Koya, which is the where the, you know, the main Shingon Buddhist temple is. Uh, and also it's a UNESCO heritage site because to get there, you walk through this ancient uh, graveyard where there's like peasants and princes and CEOs all buried there. Some uh, gravestones are like moss covered and bent and, you know, falling over and, you know, over a thousand years old. Some of them are modern, some of them are small, some of them are ornate, and they're all in the shadows of these beautiful redwood cedars. And mm. from there, you walk to the Lantern Temple, say your prayers there, and then behind the Lantern Temple is the mausoleum of Kukai, where he rests in eternal meditation. And traditionally, either before your pilgrimage or after, you go to visit Kukai. Uh, if you go before, it's to ask permission and for luck on the pilgrimage. And if you go after, you're supposed to report to him how the pilgrimage went. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. It's so rad. <laughs> <laughs> but what was so funny to me is you do this amazing thing, which is very not well known. And your explanation in the book and probably to people who ask you is, I'm here because on a random day in a class I chose because of ninjas, I saw myself in Shikoku and eight years later hated my job enough to follow through. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Life gets weird, man. It doesn't get more random than that. Yeah, yeah, and yet it all makes sense once you both read the book and also just, I don't know. I feel like that's how life goes a lot of the time. I mean, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was a journey that I was not prepared for in any way. Uh, as I say in the book, the only Japanese I spoke was water, <laughs> thank you. And I knew two ways to express disbelief a monster was attacking. Uh, helpful, and, helpful phrases. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, if the second a kaiju stomped down on the city, I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was uh, this draw that I've always had for Japan, you know, starting when I was young and I was like, oh man, there's a, there's a land that produces, you know, like karate masters dressed in black with throwing stars who can disappear, sign me up. And, you know, then I got a little older and I was like, ah, eh, you know what, maybe, maybe ninjas aren't exactly real and don't live in the sewer eating pizza. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, histo historically, it's up for debate. Exactly. Um, but I still was so fascinated with the culture. I, it got me into Zen Buddhism. It got me into martial arts and karate, which I became a black belt. And it's got me to this class in college 
called Japanese Religion and Culture, where I was just sort of on a whim decided like, yeah, you know what? They'll teach at least, at least one week will probably be about ninjas because I'm sure everyone's as fascinated with them as me. And, uh, you know, easy B. Uh, and I, of course I was disappointed in the same way mm -hmm. I was when Jewish mysticism didn't teach me how to make a mud golem, which <laughs> I'm still bummed about a little. Uh, uh -huh. But, you know, in one of these days, the teacher rolled out this, rolled out the television and put in a VHS tape because I am. Those were the very, days. I'm very 38 right now. And uh, there was this documentary on the Shikoku pilgrimage that I'd never heard of. And I see the narrator, you know, walking with his round conical hat and that, you know, is traditional if you're working in a rice field. Uh, and this white vest and this staff, you know, by these enormous rice fields and would backed by mountains and meditating beneath waterfalls and praying in these ancient temples. And in just this weird little flash that I remember, but is one of those things where it's like, I'm not sure if it was real. I saw myself on that screen, just doing hmm. the same thing, walking by those rice fields, praying at those temples, meditating under a waterfall. And just in my head, I was like, I'm going to do that. And then eight years later, I was working a job at a software company as an office manager. I don't have any useful skills. And, <laughs> and I was just, I would kind of keyed into this place through luck where I had a future. You know, I didn't like it. I woke up sighing every day. But if I just stuck with it, I had a way to make money for the rest of my life. And I thought, okay, well, you know what? I've had this pretty cool life. I've traveled a bit. I guess I just get to be sad and make money for the rest of my life. This will be cool. And Something to look forward to. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, your, that's your late 20s, I guess. Um, but, and then I just had this moment where I was like, no, 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 you, one more thing, you know, just one more hit of adventure. And then, you know, then I can quit and be totally happy being sad for the rest of my life. And I was like, what do I want to do? And that vision came back. And I said, of course, the Shikoku pilgrimage. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, I, I did not say, of course, I guess I'll learn to read a map. Or, or learn uh, Japanese. Or learn Japanese or see if my shoes fit or uh, your shoes. check if it's the, oh my God, the shoes. <laughs> or if it was, check if it was the hottest summer on record. Um, but, you know, when you're young and dumb or in your late 20s and dumb, you can, uh, you can do a lot. Yeah. You, ignorance is bliss. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> And then once you get over there and you start, it's sort of like, well, I'm here. I might as well see how this goes. Yeah. And it did not go well. Well, it, it felt like it was sort of this seesaw. Yeah. And you I know, mean, that's... between the days that completely sucked and the shoes that completely sucked. Ugh, the worst. And these days where you were, your, your mantra for the whole thing was be here now. Yeah. Which I think is whether you're talking about a through hike in the States or you're talking about like the Camino or you're talking about any of these longer paths, shall we call them, mm. is the is the challenge. Like, can you be here now? Yeah. And I mean, I think that being unprepared and having the pilgrimage be so hard. Like it was, so the third day I was, you know, collapsing from dehydration for six hours, going up this mountain, you know, called Burning Mountain, uh, just falling, getting up, walking 50 more steps, falling, and thinking like, I might pass out here. I might have to be evacuated. I might die. I'm not certain because I've never felt this bad before in my life. And I was what I thought in shape. But as you and your listeners probably know, 
the gulf between being in athletic shape and being in through hiking shape is vast. Yes. And so I was falling and getting up, but that also was the first moment where I was like, I'm going to finish this. I don't care if I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how scared I am. I will commit to this and I will finish this. And I mean, part of that was, you know, a growing sense of just willpower. And part of it was not wanting to go home after day three (laughs) and have people be like, how was the pilgrimage? And it was like, it was hot one day. And I was just like, I don't like this. (laughs) And so, yeah, just that Burning Mountain, I like I've hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and Burning Mountain is still the hardest thing I've ever done in my life physically. Um, But yeah, it was moments like that. It was the shoes not fitting and having to come to terms with the fact that even though my feet hurt literally every step I took, I still had to come to peace with that struggle and be able to say, yes, this is part of the journey instead of what I think, unfortunately, a lot of people do when they're on their first through hike and they just focus on the difficulties and start spiraling and saying, I'm not having fun. What's the point of being here? What else could I be doing? And I've never heard of anyone leaving the trail, whether it was the Colorado Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, whichever journey you go on, leaving and then saying, that was the right decision. Like, I'm really happy I didn't complete that thing. So, yeah, just the the ability to be in the moment and also accept that the moment sucked, but know that that was part of it, is what kind of opened me up to experiencing the incredible parts of the pilgrimage. And I feel like that balance was a big part of my journey and a big part of like, the lessons I took away, you know, one of them uh, was I, that I think is still something I tell people to this day is don't define your journey while you're still on it. Yeah. And that was that realization and mon- and another mantra I had really is what saved me during the pilgrimage because I could have at any day said, this is not what I wanted. This sucks. I'm, you know, it's way harder than I thought. And, you know, that would have been what I'd focused on instead of constantly looking up and saying, okay, what is this then? And what is this giving me today? And what, what did you find that answer to be when you're asking that question? What is this giving me today? Um, so many things, you know, some days it was a lesson, you know, some days it was the lesson, you know, the worst case scenario is not the only scenario. Uh, You know, when you're hiding out from guards in a toilet stall all night, because, because basically, because I'm dumb. Uh, We will speak about the sleeping situation out there, because that was (laughs) wacky. Um, And some other less, some other times, like, You know, it was taking a moment looking at this rice field that had been overturned and seeing these metallic red dragonflies just glittering in sunset and having this moment of realization that I was a continuation of a pilgrimage. I was a hen rough. I was one of many who'd stood there on that moment at that time, looking out at something like that and just feeling fortunate and lucky for what I was given. And, you know, just gratitude. Gratitude for a gifted uh, Asian pear when I was hungry. Gratitude for uh, a place to sleep when it was raining out and sometimes just looking at the ocean and seeing the beauty of ancient japan in the modern day yeah um so yeah that was that was the balance and that was a lot of the lessons that i had to take away which have stuck with me 
not every day, but let, that's not how lessons work, I think. Yeah. But, you know, more than less. And it have helped me out through a lot of other journeys and a lot of other times in my life. Well, and as part of the pilgrimage to each temple that you came to, there was a process, there was a practice that you had to do each time. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little? Sure. Um, so the basic, uh, <clears throat> there's a set series of prayers uh, as you enter every temple. Uh, the prayers are there to announce your intention to praise uh, the Buddha in whatever deity is at the temple, because there's different, uh, dip, a Buddha is just a reincarnated being. Like there's the historical Buddha who was an Indian prince, right. but then there's other bodhisattvas and Buddhas and other members of the pantheon. So each temple is built to one of those members of the pantheon in the same way that like all Catholic temples are built for Jesus and Mary and God, but there's also a patron saint. Right. So in that same way, there's a patron uh, bodhisattva. Buddha. Yeah. Um, so you walk in, you uh, announce your intention to pray to the Buddha. You pray to the Buddha. You pray that all beings achieve enlightenment. And then you recite the Heart Sutra, uh, which is the sutra that's the basis, the heart of the Buddhist teaching, which is that emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Um, and I actually, if you'd like, can go through the prayers right now. Yeah, please. Sure. Uh, so the prayers were all written phonetically in the map book, which you can order from shikokuhenrotrail.com, which is an invaluable resource for anyone who's planning to do the pilgrimage. Um, and if any of your listeners are Japanese or speak Japanese, I am so sorry for my <laughs> pronunciation. I, uh, I do apologize. So... Uyayashiku miho toke wore hashita te matsuru. Uyayashiku miho toke wore hashita te matsuru. Uyayashiku miho toke wore hashita te matsuru. Mujo jinjin mimyo ho yakusen man ganan sogu gakon kemotoku juji gagen yore shinjitsugi. Kanji zaibo satsu gyojin hanya hara mita ji shoken go un kaiku do isai ku yakushari shi shiki pu iku ku pu i shiki shiki zoku ze ku ku soku ze shiki ju so gyo shiki yakubu nyo ze shari shi ze shoho ku so fu sho fu metsu fu ku fu jo fu zo fu gen ze ko ku chu mu shiki mu ju so gyo shiki mu gen ni bi ze chu Setsu shin ni mu shiki shoko mi soku ho mu gen kai nai mu i shiki kai mu mu myo yaku mu mu myo jin nai shi mu ro shi yaku mu ro shi jin mu ku ju metsu do mu chi yaku mu toku i mu sho toku ko bodai sata i hanya hara mita ko shin mu ke ge mu ke ge ko mu u ku fu onri isai tendo mu so ku kyo ne han shan Sanze sho butsu i hanya hara mita ko toku ando kutara san yaku san bodai ko chi hanya hara mita zendai jin shu ze dai myo shu ze mu jo shu ze mu todo shu no jo isai ku shinjutsu fuko ko setsu hanya hara mita shu soku setsu watsu gyatte gyatte hara gyatte hara so gyatte boji so waka hanya shingyo Ona bokya bero shano makabo darmani handama jimbara harabarita ya un. Ona bokya bero shano makabo darmani handama shimbara hat. Mani handama jimbara harabarita ya un. Ona bokya bero shano makabo darmani handama jimbara harabarita ya un. Namu daishi henjo kongo, namu daishi henjo kongo, namu daishi henjo kongo. Ganishi ku doku fugyo o isai gato yo shujo kaigu jo butsu do arigato gozaimasu. And, that, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, that is the prayers that I would recite uh, 88 times, twice at each, 88, yeah. at each of the 88 temples. And what is that, if you were to summarize that up, what would that 
what is the the essence of the the sutra the essence of the well the essence of the sutra itself is that the buddha recognized that the basis of all the basis of every thing that is is everything that is not so once right, you so. empty yourself of your own ego you find that that emptiness is form so you are one with everything okay is sort of the basis of it uh and Thich Nhat Hanh who I have started reading a lot of um sort of puts it as you're not you're not nothing but the idea is that you are everything is a different form of the same thing so to put it as um uh Oh man, I can't remember his name. The the British Buddhist. Um forgot his name. But anyway, so to sort of put it another way, uh if you look at if you are sitting by a river and you see a little whirlpool in the river, you would identify that whirlpool as a whirlpool. Mm -hmm. But that whirlpool is just water in motion. It's just moving through. And the whirlpool itself is not really at any point, or it's not a set thing. Right. It's not the whirlpool, the water that makes up the whirlpool is not the same at any moment. It's constantly changing and constantly flowing through. And so everything you see is like that. There's an impermanence that everything you see is just matter taking a, diff taking a little shape for a moment. Got it. Yeah, if and I and then, probably butchered half of that, so I'm sorry. But it it makes sense the in someone else's head. Yeah, I get the essence. And yeah. then the the prayer itself that you just read is, I, I guess I'm not even going to assume what it what it is. So the prayer itself is what? How does that play into all of that? So Do you have an actual translation. <laughs> Oh, um, of the Heart Sutra? Yeah. I mean, I could look it up, but to be honest, uh, how it plays in is you start with you start with the, uh, the prayer that says, I've come to worship the Buddha. After that, you basically, you say that you're going to start reciting prayers to worship the Buddha. And then it's the the Heart Sutra, which is just a universal Buddhist sutra about uh, the oneness of reality. After that, it's prayers to whatever deity, and then Kobo Daishi. Um, and then the wish that all of your good deeds can spread to everything in the world. So when I was reciting those prayers, I kind of it felt very much just like recitation to me, you know, yeah. be growing up uh, Jewish. I was very used to saying things I didn't know the meaning of in a different language, uh, you know, twice a year because we were a form. Uh, but the, so part of the pilgrimage for me was trying to find a meaning in a recitation that was just another part of a ritual. And for me, it was both, like at the start, I figured out, okay, you know what? At the end of every prayer, I'm going to keep someone in mind, like a friend of mine right. who I want good things for. And so I'll be saying the prayers to them. Uh, but by the end of the pilgrimage, um, saying the prayers really became another way for me to give back to Shikoku, um, which was something that kind of, it came about gradually, but it mostly came about at the end of the land of ascetic training. As we said before, like my shoes hurt every day and yeah. it was incredibly difficult to walk. It's boring a lot of the time. Like sometimes you're seeing amazing stuff. Sometimes you're just bored and it's too hot. And because I didn't bring music or any distraction, I was there every moment. Right. And not every moment's the best. 
And there's a lot of road walking there's so as part of this. Percent of it, yeah. Like it's road walking and cars are driving by and it's not great. So, but at the land of at the end of the land of ascetic training, I sort of decided that every time I went to a temple, I wasn't just going to say the prayers and give uh give my name slip and some coins as the offerings. I was offering the pain I was in. I was offering the boredom and the strain and everything and giving that back to Shikoku and investing myself in Shikoku rather than simply saying, what am I getting from this every day? And so I think saying the prayers was kind of cool by the end because it is cool to have that ritual uh, yeah. and to feel like you're a part of, you know, this much larger thing. But it also was a way of me showing respect and saying, look, I don't know what I'm going to get out of this. Uh, I don't know if this is going to get easier, but I'm here and I'm here to respect what I'm doing. And so that kind of was what the prayers meant for me, was I'm here to pay respect to what this is and how important this is. Right. Because doing it as a hike or as a walk is not the only way to do it. No, you, I mean, what do you mean? Well, there was the bus or buses, uh, as yeah. the case may be. Yes. Yeah, so most people uh, are who do it are retirees because they have the time. And so they pay... I don't know, I think it was like two, three thousand, two, three thousand dollars. And they hop on a bus and every, and you know, the bus drives them from temple to temple in air conditioned comfort. And they get out, they're led through the prayers by the priest of the temple, and then they get their signatures and they go. Uh, you can also do it by bicycle, but the walking hen row are the most respected. And they're the ones that everyone's like, you're, you're the true deal. And then the true, true deal for the people who take it to that extra degree are the people who do it repeatedly or repeatedly and or then do it uh, in reverse or counterclockwise and stuff like that. And then you did at one point meet, I guess, towards the end, a man who had done it many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so as you, so one of the things that you bring along on the pilgrimage are these white slips called Osama Fuda. And the white slips are for, you write your name down on them and you, uh, you, and they're part of your offering at every temple, but, or you give them to people who've done you a favor, uh, which is called Osetai. And Osetai is uh, sort of an offering to both you and Kukai, who travels beside you. Um, the first five times that you circle the island, you use a white name slip. But after that, it moves on to, I believe, a green one. Uh, and then moves on to red. And by the time you've done it over 100 times, it's, the, it's called a brocade name slip. And it's like this decorated... Uh, kind of felt that actually I think I have in this book. Uh, do I? Uh, oh, I'm hoping so. Oh man, it's in one of them. Let me see if I can see if I remember where it is. This is great video, by the way, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> do we have success? We do. Oh, wow. So let's, yeah, if I can just get the yeah, color right. right. Yep. Yeah, like. Okay, wow. so. That's amazing. Yeah, let me. Incredible. There we go. Yeah, so this is what you get for doing it over a hundred times. And these are considered like incredibly valuable, like spiritually. And people like will try to open up the donation boxes 
uh, at each temple and see if they can find one of these. And I was just given it out of respect uh, for from this person who'd clearly done it a hundred times and it was very important to him. Uh, and he, you know, just uh, thought that it was pretty great that a Westerner had come and devoted themselves to doing it. Right, to get, because to get those, the brocade versions, it's not like you just say that you've done it a hundred times and you order it online and you do whatever. Like you have to actually go through a process. It's almost a little bit like getting your PCT medal or whatever. Like you have to show proof that you've done it. Yeah, and they keep uh, records. Uh, when you complete the, when you complete the uh, Shikoku pilgrimage, your name goes in a book at Temple One. And so, yeah, they, they have the list. You write down where you're from, you write down how many days it took you and your name. It's incredible. Yeah. I, I can only imagine that feeling. I mean, because this was towards the end of the trip for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, as you've kind of alluded to, it's been a struggle yeah. on, yeah. on many different <laughs> fronts. <laughs> um, but by that point, you're truly appreciating the pilgrimage that you are on. And to run into this man who then offers you this, this gift really is what it was. Um, I can't even imagine the feeling in that moment. It felt big. Um, and I think like everything on the pilgrimage, it was so much bigger in retrospect because at the time, everything is so scrambled, you know, every, every, mm -hmm. you're not on survival mode, but you're just on, oh God, what's coming next mode. <laughs> Which sounds like every through hike and pilgrimage and and whatever. Exactly, but yeah, it was, it was big. It was a big like, oh, I've met, um, I've met someone who's telling me like, yeah, you uh, you're doing it, you're, you you're doing it, you're doing it right. Which, um, to, not compare, but I don't know, just something I thought I was thinking of recently. Um, the Shikoku Henro uh, website uh, is run by a guy named David Turkington, who I sent a copy of my book when I finished it, and he gave it a positive review, which meant a lot to me because, you know, when, when you write something about something like the pilgrimage, you want to do it justice, and it is kind of a relief to know, like, okay, cool, I... Uh, the the main guy says not bad yeah yeah but um yeah it's and that and that's uh, the thing about the shikoku pilgrimage you know you meet uh, so many friendly people and so many people who are just wishing the best for you because they all know how difficult it is and it's all very important it's kind of it's like on the pacific crest trail when you meet the trail angels who've done it before. And they're just so pumped for you. And they just want to give you advice and just want to tell you like, yeah, you're, you're, I hope you're having the time of your life today. And yeah, it just, it feels, you feel a part of something. Could you and feel that? Could you, I mean, cause it's one thing like on the Pacific Crest Trail or the trails in the States, like they're fairly young in the scope of things. Um, but could you feel the weight of the history of Shikoku's pilgrimage and trail while you're doing it? Or was that more something that kind of in retrospect you really take in? It's there in pockets. Um, you know, some, when you're at a temple that's, you know, like over a thousand years old, I mean, the the, basically the location. They've replaced all the wood at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're just, you're looking at something that's, old, you know, three times older than your country. And there is that feeling of like, some, so many people have been here doing what I'm doing. You know, like, uh, like I was talking about seeing those dragonflies or when like, 
their bamboo drying racks for rice. And when you walk by a rice field, like a lot of it's automated. A lot of people are driving threshers that look like gigantic hair trimmers on wheels. <laughs> but there's also these bamboo drying racks and you see the drying rack and you see the field and you see the, the bamboo and the mountains behind it. And you just see an unbroken history. Like this is how it was. It doesn't matter that, you know, the they're threshing the rice with, you know, uh, a gas powered thresher instead of like nunchucks or whatever they used. Um, but you're also seeing like, oh my God, this was, this has been here forever. And that's, yeah, it, it's a certain weight. And that's also like one of the things about reciting the prayers that you eventually realize is these are old words. Like, you know, reciting the Heart Sutra, that is an old, old text. And you're standing where hundreds of thousands, if not more, have stood beside, have stood, and you're saying what they've said. And you're joining in to, you're joining into something that I think um, I don't know. It, it's there. I believe that there is a spiritual energy that gets put out and stays in some of these temples. And um, definitely, you know, even if it's not quantifiable by any scientific means, it does feel like you're entering into something and adding to it mm -hmm. in a very positive way, um, which. Yeah, it's really cool and something that you don't get with, you know, a through hike. Right. It's yeah, you don't you don't have that the weight of that with yeah. you. Yeah, it's and it's not like I wouldn't need, like, yeah. I mean it's a weight, but that's the weight is not like a bad thing. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's profound. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and, not a weight of responsibility, I should say. Right. And one of the things that you carry with you through that entire journey is this book for signatures. And I'm gonna quote I'm gonna quote you back to you again. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> um, but I but I really loved this because this is sort of a retrospect thing for you. Like at that, at this moment, this is late in your book and this is a retrospect for you. But I really love both the words and the image that they created. And then would, I would love to see like the, the actual physical of what I'm talking about here. So the, your actual book, but yeah. um, your words are, once out of my hands, each page is now a snapshot of 88 people I met their personalities and moods captured forever in time and place. For the rest of the ride, I leaf through this burden, lingering over 88 moments that passed while I hoped for something better. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was so strange because like the stamp book was the only, that was the only uh, thing that I had on a schedule. Like I had to be at a temple before it closed so I could get the stamp book so I could move on. You know, mm -hmm. if, I, if I didn't get to the temple in time, I'd have to camp somewhere around there and then wake up the next morning. Um, but yeah, once I finished, I don't know, I can't remember if I wrote it down, but like when I was leafing through, I literally could see the faces of each person who'd signed the book. Oh, really? Yeah, it was just uh yeah it, it was something i wish i could put better words to it but you know that that book had nine revisions me talking has barely <laughs> one <laughs> yes so yes yes let's see so here is one of my favorites and also they put uh, little strips of news of used newspaper in as a blotter okay but, um hold on just a second i am going to put this on a different view so okay. people can see this big. Okay, there we go. Uh, so it's so on you. This is the stamp book I had. Um, it has a photo or a drawing of the temple. 
right here. And like, this is the calligraphy. So this is one where they had a lot of time. Yes, that's a lot of calligraphy. Yeah, so the calligraphy is always the same, but it depends on when you get to the temple because if there's a bus, uh, if there's a group of bus pilgrims coming in, it's soup like it's just an assembly line. So like this is another one that's very intricate. Yeah. So so the red are those red stamps basically that they did. Yep. And then the calligraphy represents what? Uh, the calligraphy is the name of the temple. Okay. All right, so yeah, this one you can see was a little, this one's rushed. They ran out of ink right there. <laughs> yeah. I just got, ah, fuck it. Get out of here, white guy. I've got like 30 more of these to do. And then on the other side is a picture of the temple itself, mm -hmm. the, that yep. specific temple. Yeah, each temple entrance. Uh, so yeah, I almost didn't, I almost didn't get this. Uh, my, it was my sister who was like, I think, you know, it's worth the cost. You know, I think you'll Hell yes. it if you don't. Yeah. Here's another very rushed one. Yeah, you can see at the bottom. I yeah. just did not care, did not take the time to uh, ink up the stamp. Yeah. Which, you know, like I'm not blaming any of them for. If, I, if my job was just this. I'd be exhausted. Well, it's um, almost like as as with what you said in your book, it's a it's a captures a moment in time of each person's personality, their mood, how their day went, how close they were to closing. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's weird to have a document or like a artifact, memento, whatever you want to call it, that's such a record of your interaction with different people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a photo and it's not just a... Uh... Okay, hold on one second. Let me go back to yeah. this. Okay. Yeah, this is the last one. I just really like this one. Oh, wow. That's very. That's a very exuberant calligraphy. Yeah, yeah, I really like that one. Um, but yeah, it's just so interesting to have this record of your interaction with somebody else that you never speak to. But it's such a, it's a individualized, yeah, it, it's a document of the time I shared with one other person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just very worth having. I, I mean, grant you, this is in retrospect, knowing what this now is, but I cannot even believe that you were thinking about not having, not getting it, not doing it. <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> it's hard to both overstate how unprepared I was, but also, <laughs> <Yes. clears throat> but yeah, it's also just a, um, I didn't know what the pilgrimage was, you know, I didn't know what it would be. It was just sort of, <clears throat> it was just sort of this wacky idea I had. And, you know, like I literally was thinking like, oh, I'll probably, you know, get in karate matches with all of the monks to test our spirit. And, you know, some old guy will give me a sword because he's like, ah, you deserve it. And I'm like, totally, I'm awesome. And, uh, you know, and then, so that's kind of where the title came from, where I had this idea of like, I'd be fighting monks and having this wild karate adventure. And then there was the harsh reality of something like Burning Mountain, where I'm collapsing from dehydration, I'm scared, I'm in pain, and I don't know what's coming next. And that is, that that made the pilgrimage in the end. And I actually did get in a karate match with a priest, which was awesome. You did get your moment. I did get my moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one of the things that we've kind of alluded to a few times in this conversation, which to me is a big part of the overall pilgrimage as well, is where the hell you're sleeping. Mm. Because 
there seemed to sort of be places for you to sleep that were associated with or or recognized as part of the pilgrimage. And then there's you sleeping in a toilet stall or under a bridge or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the pilgrimage is like the Camino. There are established little inns called ryokans or uh, mish nishokans. I can't remember the other name of them. Uh, that about 60, 70 bucks a night, breakfast and dinner available. You got to get to them at a certain time, but you get a little room, you get a, uh, you get a, a futon to sleep on. And that is what, that's where most people go, you know, especially the bus pilgrims. And that's kind of the part of the economy of the Shikoku pilgrimage. But me wanting to do it on the cheap uh, and having to do it on the cheap, uh, I just, camped out nearly every night. Um, as a walking pilgrim, you occasionally get uh, these little lodgings called Zen Konyado, where, you know, you're either let in by a shop owner or uh, someone, attempt, someone at the temple, and it's anything from, you know, a, a little extra room, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, what would be called a mother-in-law apartment here or you know it's a garage uh or just uh you know a room underneath the temple but for the most part yeah i camped out every night there's um these things called rest huts which is basically like a roof a bench and a uh, concrete pad and you can set up your tent there but if there's not one near you uh, you are setting up anywhere. I'd set up in a bus stop. I'd set up on a lawn. Uh, yeah, one night I slept in a toilet stall. That wasn't, that's its own adventure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to camp. And I think the Shikoku, pe the people of Shikoku just kind of understand, like if a tent's going <laughs> up, it's like, yep, there, there's another pilgrim. So, so the people of the government of Shikoku just, I mean, let you sort of put up your tent wherever, wherever you could find space, so to speak? I or... mean, you know, be respectful about it. Like, don't set up in anyone's, like, yard or, right. I don't know, in front of a place of business. But for the most part, yeah, I mean, you hmm. you can set up on a lawn, you can set up, um, you know, next to a business on like a concrete pad or a uh, like a little gravel area. I mean, there's a lot of places to sleep, but the um, the rest huts are where everyone wants to stay because sometimes uh, the locals will put out a little cooler with like you know, soda in it or iced coffee. And it's just like, I I was roughing it hard on the pilgrimage. So any little bit of like- Free? Kindness, oh my God, yeah. Like an iced coffee in the morning, just mwah. Major day. Nothing better. Well, it was funny because I'm sure it wasn't funny to you at the time, but you had the map to get you from- from temple to temple you were but you couldn't necessarily read the signs i mean there were there are these bollards uh like little posts uh that are some are stone some are wood and they have like the number of the temple in you know the western number and an arrow okay. but that's about it and so you'd come to a crossroads and hopefully there'd be one of those. And if you're in a city, there are also these little oval stickers with cartoon Henro on them. And so if you <laughs> saw those on like a stop sign or like uh, a lamppost, you're like, all right, I'm going the right way. <laughs> I'm following the cartoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the other two big things that that seem to play out for your entire uh, journey was finding some place to sleep each night mm -hmm. 
And food, finding food. Yeah, I could not find food, uh, especially at the beginning. I think I lost like 20, 30 pounds in my first two weeks. Um, and that was like, looking back on it, I think that was just a matter of me not knowing how to ask like, where's a grocery store? Or taking the time to just wander around any of the cities. But there just didn't seem to be anywhere that had actual food. I mean, if I saw like a if I saw, like, especially in the start in Tokushima, I mean, some nights my dinner was squid, dried squid and two bananas. And that's just like what, that's just like what was in a little shop that I could eat. Um, and I'm sure that the people in those towns, like, had a grocery store or something. I mean, they couldn't have all been harvesting rice for all their meals, but I just couldn't find anything. So I was constantly starving, uh, especially, and especially like it was so hot and the hiker hunger only kicks in after two weeks. So I'm burning like probably five to 6,000 calories and maybe putting two back in. And so, yeah, it was like that, that alone probably made it a lot harder to navigate because my brain wasn't getting any energy to it. <laughs> it was all going to my legs. Yeah. Um, Did you yeah. like with the food? Because on a an American traditional through hike, you shop, you get food, you put it in your pack, and then you have that for the next however many days, and you have yeah. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But it didn't seem like you had that going for you. Yeah. It just, I was told that there'd just be food, you know, convenience stores called convenies everywhere. And by the time I got out of Tokushima and kind of further into Kochi, that was the case. Um, but yeah, since I'd never been on a through hike, I don't think I knew you could bring days of food with you. <laughs> I think I just thought like, yeah, it's, you know, every every spot will have like a gas station i'll just get food there it turns out that gas stations don't have food in japan and like i think i realized later too it's the same with english like i expected so many people to speak english but that would be like a spanish person coming to like I don't know, America and expecting all of us to speak fluent Spanish just because we learned it in high school. Because mm -hmm. I knew the JET program had been out there and that they're like English private schools, but it's rural Japan. And like, like if a Spanish person came up to me after high school in desperate need of help, I think the only thing I could say to them in Spanish was like, I like your shoes. <laughs> Did you buy them at the shoe store? is that to the left or the right of the library? Like, yeah. Like I don't, I don't know why I was expecting the Japanese people to do that. And the, the other funny thing is like, I actually spoke pretty decent Spanish at that point because I'd lived in Spain for a little bit. And so I'd have this weird thing in my mind where I'd, they weren't, they didn't understand English and I'd switch to Spanish for like, just automatically. And then in my brain, I had this like thought that I'm is completely wrong. But I was like, God damn it, why don't you speak Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, just, uh, just <laughs> I don't ugly even know what to say to that. <laughs> I know. I was just ugly Americaning left and right. And like I never got mad at them about it. Like I, I wasn't an asshole. But it just like in my head, I was so unprepared that I was just like, yeah, of course they'll speak English. It's Japan. Like, why wouldn't everyone speak my language? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and but a lot of that was also, you know, when you can't speak to anyone, you spend a lot of your time with yourself. And that's, I think, valuable time too. Yeah. Even if it's you... not fun time. No. Well, and particularly since you chose not to bring with you distractions, essentially, 
Um, yeah. And, and that was both on the level of something like to listen to and that kind of thing. But you also weren't allowing yourself uh, alcohol and there was something else as well. I'm trying to remember what it was. Uh, I think it was no alcohol. I had to walk every step. Um, no electronics besides a camera and a voice recorder for my journal and a journal every night. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you, you slimmed it down. So you were stuck with nobody but you mm -hmm. on this, on this path. Yeah. And it, like I, when I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, I'm very happy that I had like music and distraction because it's so long but I also will never like I'll always appreciate that I was stuck with myself on Shikoku I feel like that's such a valuable experience and I part of me always wishes that I'd done more of that on my other hikes because it's once you force yourself to be present, especially in the modern era where there are so many distractions at all times, uh, it is wild. Like I was meditating every day and I went through a couple of times something that I can only describe as completely sober, lucid mushroom trip where like I suddenly everything came into focus. Everything was extra three-dimensional and I just felt this connection to the ground and to my surroundings that seemed like I was looking at everything almost from above. And that was only from meditation. And uh, yeah, I'd be, it'd be rad if I could still do that. Uh, you just need to walk another 750 miles. Oh, yeah, easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kind of devolve into a specific moment that just fascinated me because I've never heard of it before. I'm sure there's probably other people who are listening to this who have, but the very concept of it just fascinated me. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the cormorant fishing. Oh, yeah. Can you <clears throat> talk about like what that is? Because it's not just fishing <laughs> with the hook. <laughs> so cormoran fishing is this very traditional way to catch fish where they have these uh, cormorants, a seabird, and they have them on leashes and they just chuck them in the water and the cormorants like swim underneath and snatch fish and then they reel them back in on the leash and pull the fish out of their jaws. So it's kind of like the aquatic version of those Mongolian eagle hunters. Yeah. And that's... And, and they're in it. these, like, uh, they're in, uh, because I think it's kind of a tourist attraction thing, they uh, are in these boats with, like, lanterns on the front and dressed in traditional garb. It's really cool. I feel like watching that happen, I mean, just in general, I can literally sit at the beach and watch pelicans diving for for fish and coming up and, and doing all of that. I can only imagine how long I could sit there and watch cormorants fishing. It, again, it's super wild. And then like, it's also funny because it feels like the cormorants are like, this time he'll let me keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there is that, that other side of the coin, so yeah. to speak. <laughs> And, and it makes me also think, and this is just a random stray thought, but it makes, because every once in a while, like you hear about something or see something and you're like, I wonder what the first person who ever tried this was thinking. Mm. Like, how did this come to be? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, man, those cormorants are really successful at this. I wonder if they're employable. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you could, yeah, I just, it fascinates me, like that very concept of, of the inception of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the first person who saw a cow and was like, I bet I could drink that milk. Mm -hmm. Or the first person who said, I could eat this egg. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, and I always, I'm kind of envious of the first person who thought of like cooking meat on a fire. I bet that guy was a legend in his tribe for like (laughs) the rest of his life. Yeah. They probably named that after him. Definitely. There was a special grilling that was named Mm -hmm. after him. (laughs) But speaking of food, one of the things that you also mentioned in your book that intrigued me so much is the Kit Kats. Yeah. So in- uh, I was going to say Kit Kats in America are- boring in comparison oh yeah so like so uh in japan uh kitakatsu means uh good luck and so parents started buying kit kats uh for their children as sort of a good luck treat before they went and took tests and because you know the japanese just tend to focus in on certain things and just make a subculture out of it and also because Kit Kat bars are not that good, they've developed this just spectrum of Kit Kat flavors. Like there's green tea, there's like Earl Grey tea, there's melon, there's strawberry, there's kiwi, there's, and they're making new ones all the time. And they're just the most delicious, creamy, amazing treats that have ever been like made they're one of the best tasting chocolates i've ever had and you still have the taste of the chocolate right yeah and then it's just that other flavor kind of on top of it or yeah it's like into it yeah it's the like it's the for like the milk tea one which is my favorite uh it's like this creamy earl gray so it's kind of like a white chocolate mixed with just like extra creamy black tea and it was just i mean i think everything tasted better because i was starving uh There's but that. yeah the kit the kit kats and the kit kats were just the one of the cool little uh subcultures i discovered there or like little cultural treats and so every time i saw a uh a um vending machine I got a little pumped because it might have a new flavor of Kit Kat I hadn't tried (laughs) that became part of the pilgrimage to see how many different flavors you could try Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it makes me it definitely makes me want to search out a Japanese market here because I'm in LA Um, but search out a Japanese market and see if they've got them like the different flavors they have a couple of them I've seen them at like uh, a couple of the Asian markets here in Washington but I still can't find milk tea. <laughs> You've got a lobby for it. I know, right? <laughs> and and speaking of vending machines, there was one particular vending machine that was like the piece de resistance of mm. all vending machines. Oh, the underpants vending machine? The underpants vending machine. <laughs> I know, I felt what? so lucky. I. That was one of those things I didn't know, I heard about, but I was like, that's not real. Like, there's no way that vending machines sell ladies underwear in Japan for like perverts, most likely. But yeah, yeah, I managed to find one. And uh, you know what? They were reasonably priced. (laughs) Yeah, I, again, fascinates, the whole concept fascinates me. Because it wasn't just selling under ladies' underwear. It was selling a couple of other things as well, right? Yeah. yeah I just but, don't remember what they were. You know, I mean, either. I think you've read the book more uh, <laughs> more recently than I have. Probably. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm writing another one. So sorry if I'm not able to like recall no worries. all the details. The, the people who are listening will have to oh, read condoms. the book. I think they were selling condoms to... And I swear to God, a dildo. I think there was a dildo in there. So, so the people who are listening to this podcast now have to read the book in order to get the act, the accurate uh, tally of what was in that vending machine. Yes, be sure if you buy the book for nothing else, <laughs> you gotta you gotta buy it for the weird vending machine I found. Yeah. Uh, but um, it, it feels like that's all, though. Kind of part of the experience of the pilgrimage is both the be here now, but also the being open to random 
moments, random things that are happening to you at any given moment. Yeah, and that was the the fun of it, you know, the fact that, you know, like when you're, <clears throat> when you, and I, I'm talking about the difference between this and through hiking, but mm -hmm. I love through hiking. Through hiking is incredible for me. So never think I'm discounting how great it is. But yeah, one of the cool things about the Shikoku pilgrimage and maybe any pilgrimage is there's just such a different, so many more things could happen on any given day. You know, you could yeah. have an encounter with somebody, but you can also see something cultural. You could also find something you'd never seen before. Um, you know, you and yeah, it just, it's what kind of the excitement was because it's the excitement of being in a foreign city where you're never sure what's around the next corner. But it's also the excitement of being out in the rice fields and being in this ancient land. And yeah, so it, it really was a matter of just being open and being curious at all times. And speaking of one of those moments, um, I love your description of it in the book, but I love that you add this picture to <laughs> your book as well. And you know, ex you probably know, know exactly. Yeah, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> that was bizarre. Which is this essentially. Oh, the 500 rock on. I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to say when I found myself on a cigarette vending machine. Oh, well, there's that too. But yeah, for right now, so, we'll start with the 500. Oh, yeah. The, so the 500 rock on. So those are the 500 original followers of the Buddha. And when I, I was uh, at a mountaintop temple and I had done the prayers, was kind of wandering around. And I stepped into this courtyard and there's 500 different life-size statues, each of which are like grotesquely uh, overemphasized, like all of the features are different mm -hmm. and they're all different emotions and there's warriors and drunks and people with different animals. And it was just so strange and magical to walk through this sculpture garden yeah. of all of these and just with no idea what they were but still in this weird mysterious place that forever that I knew I would never fully understand but still just seemed so profound in its own way and yeah finding the rock on was wild it was wild to me because you weren't expecting to find them you no, never were looking before. for them no context for what they were and it was really very random that it's almost like one of those things where you're going in one direction you turn your head to look a different direction and it's like ah yeah <laughs> there it is you know yeah and it was, there was always more that the pilgrimage had to offer. And I think, you know, in times like seeing the rock on were moments where it was just like, this thing is so much bigger and more fascinating than I'll ever fully get. But there was also that feeling of like, so I need to just appreciate and feel the wonder of it as it is. Because, yeah, because I'm here now. And while I wish I could have a greater understanding at the moment, I have to just live with the understanding I have at the moment and accept it. Would you ever think of doing it again? Oh, yeah. Uh, with If I had the time and the money, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I think it would be so fascinating now that I actually can hike and now that I actually know everything about it to just see what else I can gain from it. What would you do differently? Uh, so many things. <laughs> How uh, much think, time do you have? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, to start off, I would pick a better shoe choice. 
Um, something for anyone who's planning on doing this to know is 90% of it's on concrete. And so you're better off, don't get a shoe with a rock plate for certain. Do not get a shoe with a metal rock plate. Uh, get comfortable walking shoes that will last. Um, go, I would go in the fall or the spring. I would not go in the summer because it's just too hot and too humid. Um, I do a lot more reading. I definitely read my book again uh, <laughs> before going because I include so much cool uh, history and culture in it as well. Yeah. Um, and I think I would walk, I would do like 15 miles a day. I don't think I do 18 to 20. I, uh, I was, I feel like I was rushing it because, you know, I was in so much pain. I just wanted it to be over faster, but I would definitely take a lot more time and I would do a bit more research to which cultural festivals are going on. Cause I think it'd be cool to like see the Adori festival or like a, a cherry blossom festival. And I would bring extra money for ramen because the ramen was incredible. I've never had anything that good. Like the ramen here is okay, but man, it's like American chocolate versus like German or British chocolate. You know, once, the real stuff. Once you've had the real stuff, yeah, or German beer versus like Budweiser. Yeah, once you've had the real, I bet it's hard to go back to uh, the so imitation. Hard. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but it's oof. The broth alone is just incredible. But I'm not a food writer, so that's as far as I can go with it. <laughs> you don't have all of the adjectives to describe it. Yeah, I have good and real good and more, please. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's the extent of uh, my guest hosting on Chopped. <laughs> Just wait, wait, there wasn't, other than the fact that your feet were killing you, literally, um, there wasn't anything, there wasn't any sort of pressure on you to have to finish at a certain time or to speed through things or anything like that, right? No, I mean, I uh, actually finished it a lot faster than I thought, so I had to change my flight a little earlier. Um, but no, there was, there's no real pressure to hurry. Uh, I think I just kind of put that on myself because it becomes, it's hard not to make it a stamp race. Uh, I think, you know, I just, had, I still had a lot of competition in me because, you know, I was still doing uh a competitive martial art but yeah I think I uh I think taking more time at each temple would have been a good thing as well you know just really doing it as more of a contemplative walk and I don't know maybe later in life I'll go back and just do it again slow down really appreciate it a bit more I, I was laughing as you're describing because at a certain point you meet a couple of other people who are English speaking. And I think one of them was Elizabeth who was doing the contemplative mm -hmm. walk. Yeah. And she had convinced you to, to slow down a little bit. Um, but I was laughing that you would always, you would get someplace and you would see these people who were going slower ahead of you still. And you're like, how? Yeah. I, I still don't <laughs> get that. <laughs> They, they had warp whistles or something because like I would try to slow down and then like honestly I think that cigarettes are like performance enhancing drugs for the <laughs> Japanese because like so many of them were puffing away and they'd just be like leaving me in the dust and I, I, I still have no explanation it, it was the weirdest thing ever but yeah just slow and contemplative I guess wins the race yeah because I mean, that's a, I hadn't thought of that because I guess I was very much focused on the pilgrimage, the walk side of it. But, you know, in the States, when somebody's doing, when somebody, when a foreigner comes in to do like the PCT, the CDT or the AT, there's that six month window that they've got to get done. And there's so many miles to do. And they feel that push the whole time. But with mm -hmm. only 750 miles, you have time to stop and smell the roses, so to speak. Yeah. And enjoy the the towns and you say the the festivals and the other things that are also going on in these places that you're passing through yeah yeah and like I think I would have 
taken more time uh, going to the onsens, which are Japanese spas that were amazing and just like lifesavers sometimes. Like I wish we had spa culture in the US like that. Um, yeah, I, I think that it, it's, it should be a walk to be done contemplatively. Um, and if I was a little older and more mature, uh, I think that's how I would have taken it. But, and, you know, in more comfort. Mm -hmm. um, with different shoes. With different, yeah, God, by different shoes. Well, and that was part of also a, a, a thing, or it was, it became even a bigger thing. You know, making the wrong shoe choice is one thing. But when you're in a country that does not have feet the size of yours, you get yeah. stuck with your choices, basically. Yep. Yep. Uh, I was very stuck with my choices. Uh, and I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's, always, it's hard not to think like what you'd do differently mm -hmm. uh, the next time you'd go. Um, but it also, I don't know. I kind of have to accept that because I did the pilgrimage in the way I did, I got the lessons that I got, which were how I, you know, learned a better way to hike say the pacific crest trail mm -hmm. uh which i would also do differently if i had the <laughs> chance to do it again so it never ends <laughs> yeah well i feel like not to to uh pull out a trope but the trail provides the lessons you need at that moment in your life so going yep. back and doing it again it's going to be a different experience because you're a different person. You're at a different point in your life. Yeah. And I mean, like, even before I went on the pilgrimage, I, it turned out there was a Shingon Buddhist temple uh, near where I was living in Seattle. And the guy told me, like, it's the journey you need before I left. And I was like, yeah, I really need an old guy to give me a sword. You're right. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, it's, um, I think that's, and, and that's something that um, I tried to put in the book and something that I've carried with me is when you finish journeys like this, sometimes the answers aren't exactly clear as to what it meant and, you know, what you got out of it. And I hope that people who are in that gray area of not getting the cinematic, like, I don't know, you know, in wild where she throws the shoe or whatever, you know, when you're not like sitting there crying as, you know, all of the epiphanies come at once. <laughs> like only it were that uh, easy. I know. Right. It's like, don't, don't get discouraged. You know, don't think like, oh, it was a failure because every time you go on a hike, like the, the answers are there for you. Like the, they're provided, but the trail, no trail works a miracle you know you need to put them together when you get back and you know that's why if you take nothing away from this keep a journal like whenever you go on a journey keep a journal and make it as detailed as you can because it's you will look back on your journal years later and learn so much about where you are now yeah the trail I mean, opens you up. Yeah. Yeah. It opens you up and it give it, it's up to you to put the answers together, but they're there. Yeah. 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 Is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should? Um, I mean, let's see. We could talk about uh, fighting the priest. We could talk about... Um, uh, Hmm. I don't know. Sorry. Right? I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you read the book more recently than <laughs> I have. Are there any other questions that you have? There, there are a couple of things, but let's talk about fighting the priest really quick. Yeah. Okay. No, um, if you want to go on to the other things, let's do that. We'll save, we'll save it for the end. Okay. We'll save that for the end then. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Taylor. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, just not to screw it up. His name is Jamie. I just, oh, because his 
Yeah, I know. Because his family members were dead and I didn't know the legalities, I just didn't use his name in the book. But yeah, his name was Jamie Bernard. Okay. So I wanted to talk about Jamie a little bit. Sure. Because that became quite a defining moment for you on the pilgrimage, as well as once you got home again. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was my first uh, that was my first suicide yeah. that uh, I dealt with, uh, and I wish it was the last one. Uh, unfortunately, if God, I wish that was even the hardest one. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about suicide. Well, I talk about suicide, but also depression, but also, mm. you know, I mean, because one of the things that you also had to do through the course of your pilgrimage is forgive yourself for a feeling of not being there, of of not being enough to potentially keep him there, but knowing why he did it because you guys were so such good friends. Yeah, I mean, I think, It's tough. Something I've learned uh, about suicide is that a lot of people believe that it's almost an accident. You know, like they imagine that this person was just standing too close to a window and tripped. You know, it was just sort of one bad day or one bad moment. And that they're, you know, as they're falling, they're reaching out. If you can just race forward and just catch their hand and you'll pull them back you know, and that it was up to you. But a lot of the time, they're not facing you. They're turned away and they're not, they didn't trip out of a window. They walked up to it and they jumped. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, one of the, yeah, one of the things was that Jamie had been a childhood friend of mine and we'd grown up together and been like each other's best friends and then sort of grown apart. And one of the reasons was we were both dealing with depression in different ways. And I, at that point, didn't have the emotional bandwidth to help him. And when we finally got back together and were able to um, reconnect, you know, I was like, cool, I can, you know, be more here for him when I get back. And then he, uh, things got too much for him due to family issues, and he took his own life. And the guilt of that was, it took a while to process, because it's kind of hard, guilt and grief are very personal to each experience and very personal to each person. And so no one can really, people can tell you like the basics of it, but it's kind of up to you every time to figure your own way through it. And for me, like a lot of the, when I learned that he killed himself, I remember like the world shifted, like there was an earthquake and just, I remember everything tilting to the side. And then every memory I had with him just flashed back all at once. And You know, I cried about it, but then I couldn't really do anything. So I just continued the pilgrimage, you know, flying back wasn't going to make a difference. And getting back, there was just, I'd start crying at random times and I couldn't figure out where the, what this was because, you know, he'd been my best friend for a decade of our lives, but it also been almost a decade since we'd really hung out and been close. So you know, there were a lot closer people in my life that I would think, you know, would be more upsetting to me. Uh, And really what it came down to, I realized at his wake was his girlfriend saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, Jamie talked about you guys a lot. And me realizing that I'd kind of forgotten about him. You know, not, not who he was, you know. But, you know, because I saw him every year at his father's holiday party, but kind of what he meant to me and what those 10 years of our friendship had meant and how I'd grown as a person because of it, you know, little and big things. And so, 
Yeah, so it was sort of realizing that all we leave to each other are memories of each other. And so I wanted to start leaving better memories to certain people, including my family. So that caused a lot of reconciliation. Um, but yeah, that uh, suicide's tough. And I've dealt with chronic depression most of my life. So it's not, I never question why people do it. Uh, to me, it's at this point, I feel like it's more of a stroke, you know, just someone's brain killed them. Mm. But, you know, it's also hard to, it's hard to think of it that way because it seems so much like a choice. Yeah. And I'm not certain that it is. I mean, in any more than addiction's a choice, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's, it's your brain demanding you do something and, you know, it's hard to fight against your own brain. Yeah. How were, how was you, were you on the pilgrimage, like with your depression? Because I mean, you're very isolated because you don't speak English, you don't speak Japanese. The nature of the pilgrimage in general is going to have you being kind of isolated. Lots of time in your head. Um, the I don't remember the depression being too bad because the anxiety was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> One outweighed the other. Yeah, exactly. It's like, why think about how I failed everyone I know when I'm already like, oh God, is there another burning mountain coming up? Or am I going to get charged by a boar again? <laughs> oh yes, the boars. Yeah, T it takes your mind off of things. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, honestly, the the depression was pretty backseated because, um, which I think happens on a lot of through hikes, which is some of the beauty of hiking, yeah. is that you are so focused on everything else that there's not a lot of room for bullshit. You know, like the Thank mistakes God. you make, yeah. The mistakes you make while you're hiking have real consequences. And so it kind of filters out a lot of the, you know, low level anxieties that just come from, you know, living in especially American society. Yeah. Where can people find you if they have further questions or should need to find your book uh, or want to follow your continuing adventures? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or uh, yeah, Instagram at Barack Outdoors, B as in boy, A-R-A-C-H, Outdoors. Um, I will have a new website up at some point, but, uh, you know, don't hold your breath. I'm kind of busy on stuff. Uh, and you can find my book on Amazon, uh, Fighting Monks and Burning Mountains, Misadventures on a Buddhist Pilgrimage, and that'll be an ebook audiobook and print Beautiful. so uh if you thought man i could really i could really use eight more hours of this voice uh <laughs> get the audiobook <laughs> oh so you read your own book huh i did yeah i, I love it. it i love it yeah um my my final question of mo basically most of these podcasts is what is the moment like when you when somebody asks you about the pilgrimage what is the moment that sort of flashes into your mind first that that has <laughs> i guess we could actually go with you for two two sides both the the painful memory that flashes into your mind first but also the joyous grateful memory that flashes into your mind first uh man so uh, Burning Mountain was such an extended horror of panic, but I think one of the most painful moments, uh, it was, I was taught, like, you'll, anyone who reads the book, you'll know how messed up my feet were, but there was this one day where, I think it was 
it was Rosh Hashanah and I'd called my dad and we were just talking back and forth and I'm just lying and saying like, <laughs> yeah, the pilgrimage is going great. It's going oh, fantastic. Uh, and I'd switched to sandals because my feet were so blistered up in between the toes. I just like, it was more painful to walk on sandals, but it blistered up less. And so I'm telling my dad, I'm just lying to my dad, like, yep, getting so much out of this, definitely worth uh, spending most of my savings on. And then I hung up the phone and turned around and started walking and my bruised up, blistered pinky toe just slammed right into my walking staff. And I had to bend over because I was swearing so hard, I ran out of breath. Oh, so that was the most painful. Um, the moment I always come back to is getting is having that karate match on a mountaintop at temple at dusk with the other priest, which was just a moment of such sheer. This is what I wanted. After thank you, universe. Yeah, after thirty days of. You know, the boar, the monkeys, which also were pretty scary, you know, uh, sleeping in a toilet stall all night because of heat exhaustion, breaking part of an ancient temple, getting a leg infection, finding out Jamie'd killed himself, and just go going on and moving on and being like, there's got to be something else to this pilgrimage. There is something. Just keep going. And then just a random slew of circumstances of just me and a priest mutually agreeing to square off and get into a karate match like I'd always wanted was just this moment of like, look, I have to be a very beloved husband and a real great father to write that on my tombstone instead of karate match with a priest on a mountaintop. Like, that's what I want to be remembered for. <laughs> As they say, fighting monks. Yep, fighting monks and past those burning mountains. A very special thank you to Paul for sharing his stories from the trail and Maya Wynn for the use of the song, Try Again. On next week's episode, I'll be talking with Frosty, known off trail as Jess Rochelle, about her adventures on the PCT in 2020. I hope that this conversation, these conversations, inspire you to get out there and have a few hiker trash moments of your own. I'll see you on the trail. <laughs>